Bacteriophages are becoming really interesting viruses nowadays. They target bacteria and have been used for therapeutic purposes in other parts of the world. Recently, the emergence of antiviral resistance has spurred a renewed interest in using these viruses or their products as therapeutic tools against recalcitrant human pathogens, what we call the endemic pandemic um, and the silent pandemic. AAC also actually very recently published a manuscript um, from the Antimicrobial Resistant Leadership Group, who, that is an NIH sponsor uh, group, uh, to guide clinicians and um, developers in the use of phages for clinical practice. Today, we will discuss with experts in the field the state of the art in phage therapy and all the nuances of this interesting approach. So the objectives of this podcast is to understand the use of bacteriophages and their products for therapeutic purposes, discuss the clinical applications of these phages, and debate the barriers for developing these phages as therapeutic tool, and particularly when treating uh, multidrug-resistant infections. Welcome to Editors in Conversation. This episode is brought to you by the Antimicrobial Agents and Chemotherapy Journal available at aac.asm.org. Um, I am your host, Cesar Arias, Editor-in-Chief of AAC, and this podcast is supported by the American Society for Microbiology, which publishes AAC. Don't forget to check our, uh, check our latest issue of AAC, available at uh, our we- website with outstanding papers on mechanisms of resistance, pharmacology of antimicrobial agents, epidemiology, clinical therapeutics, among others. Joining us to discuss this important topic, we have a really uh, distinguished panel. Um, is Dr. Vincent Fischetti, who is professor and head of the Laboratory of Bacterial Pathogenesis and Immunology at the Rockefeller University in New York. Dr. Saima Aslam, who is professor of medicine and director of the Solid Organ Transplant Infectious Diseases Service and clinical lead of, for the Center of Innovative Applications and Therapeutic, IPATH, at the University of California, San Diego, in San Diego, California and Dr. Anthony Mareso, who is professor and founder of the Taylor Labs at the Department of Molecular Biology and Microbiology at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston, Texas. Uh, Welcome, uh, ladies and gentlemen, to the podcast. It's really an honor to have you here. So phages is our topic today. Let's start with with Dr. Fischetti. Uh, Vince, when do you tell the audience what phages and the phage products um, that are relevant for the discussion. Just explain for for the audience that are not familiar with this, what what those are. Okay, so phages are viruses that only infect bacteria. They don't infect human tissue. So when a phage infects a bacteria, it injects its DNA into the host cell. And once that DNA gets into the cell, it takes over the cell for the production of new virus particles. And once those virus particles are assembled, the phage have a problem. They need to get out of that organism. They solve the problem by producing an an enzyme called the lysin that works in concert with a holin molecule that is phage encoded. The holin punches a hole in the membrane. And once that membrane hole is is exposed, the lysin goes through the hole, cleaves the bonds in the peptidoglycan. And since the pressure inside the bacteria is greater than the external environment, the organisms explode, releasing their phage progeny in in the environment to start a new cycle. That whole process is phage therapy, using phage and, the, and, its, fa- and its cycle to kill a bacteria. What we've done, and, and, and another product is, is phage lysin, using the lysin itself as a, as a standalone molecule that can be used from the outside to punch a hole in the bacteria, causing the ex- explosion process and killing the organism. So those are the two main ways we're using to kill bacteria. So great. So let me see if I understand correctly. So you have like a, a big phage, like it's like, you know, the, 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 the main sort of entity that you can deploy. But you also have like the, the little weapons that the phage use, and you can use both for therapeutic purposes. Is that correct? Correct. You use the whole virus itself or what it produces to actually kill the organism in the end. Okay, great. So this idea, let's go to Dr. Aslan. This idea of using phages for therapeutic purposes is not really new. And in Eastern Europe, um, they have been used for a long time. And I remember talking to somebody who can actually go to any pharmacy um, and and get a phage cocktail for a cold. Um, So tell us about that that story and how 
now we are using it for different purposes in Western medicine? Thank you. Well, thank you for the question. Um, so you're right. Phages actually were initially discovered in the early 20th century. And when they were first discovered, they were actually being used to treat infections at that time based on sort of infectious syndrome. So there were sort of phage combinations that were available to treat dysentery, available to treat pneumonia or sort of, you know, rhino uh, sinusitis type infections and UTIs. Once penicillin and other antibiotics came along, this sort of fell out of favor in Western medicine. Uh, so initially actually discovered in England and France. Um, but it sort of stayed on, you're right, in Eastern Europe and Russia, where there are phage therapy centers with, you know, many decades of experience. Um, so what changed, at least in Western medicine and in the U.S., was uh, the first case that was treated in 2016 at UCSD. So one of my colleagues, Tom Patterson, actually developed a very highly drug-resistant acinetobacter bomini infection. Um, and actually was, you know, running out of time in an ICU setting uh, because there were no available antibiotics to treat his infection. His wife, Stephanie Strathy, who currently is one of the co-directors at IPATH, um, found some papers online that looked at phage activity against this organism and convinced uh, Chip Schooley, who's our other co-director, to treat her husband. Um, and so that was a pretty spectacular mm -hmm. success. Uh, somebody who we thought would die walked out of the ICU, you know, is doing great five years later. So since then, I think there certainly has been a lot of experience, sort of these one-off cases and case series um, that we've been using in the US and Europe, uh, you know, South America, India, many parts of the world. Um, and there's been successes and there's been some failures. And I think we're learning how to go about doing this in a way to um, have a higher rate of success. As you mentioned earlier, there's a huge, uh, you know, growing burden of multidrug resistance globally. And with this growing burden of MDR organisms, we are running out of options to treat patients. And I think phages is certainly filling that niche. And I think uh, it will be a growing niche. Um, and once we start treating MDR infections, there are so many other levels of infections that can be treated, such as, you know, infections that require biofilm penetration. Um, so I think it's definitely a growing field at this time um, and definitely sort of of interest both for funding, uh, both, you know, by federal funding as well as industry funding and research. So great, great, great uh, explanation. Um, so the, the, there are um, some skepticism out there and I count myself on that boat, uh, you know, at least still a little bit, including in that case, which I think, you know, it's hard to assume, assume that was just the medical for the phase, you know, and, and, you know, we actually have uh, published several, a couple of cases in challenging clinical cases of antimicrobial resistance, which, you know, support that, but there's always this question. So, the, um, Anthony, so what, why, so you, you created a company to try to address this properly, you know, um, because there are barriers. Can you explain what are the barriers and why, you would need a, such a sophisticated setup that you are now setting up here in Houston to, to try to deliver this properly? Yeah, sure. So the it's it's actually a center at, at Baylor, uh, Cesar. It's, uh, it's not a, a for-profit company, but uh, what we're trying to do is is create a end-to-end uh, -end pipeline to, to make these phages so that we can provide them to, to clinicians who who will want to use them and, and, and also to do the science behind some of the skepticism. So as you mentioned, there are a number of barriers. And I think the first barrier is just culture. We just went through and hopefully are at the tail end of, of, of a pandemic where a virus sort of ravaged the world's uh, way of living. And yet we're now telling people that we should uh, use viruses to cure their infections with something else, right? So it's a cultural barrier to start. I think the second is, is remember these are biological entities. They're, they're not small molecules like antibiotics are. And so that means scalability is, is, is potentially an issue because every one of them is unique in its own right and, and may have specific ways in which it has to be made. And then I think a, a, a third barrier is, is, and this is also related to culture, but the the regulatory approval process is, 
is not fit or or currently set up to to easily deal with the use of of a biologic like this as a medicine. And and that's something that would have to be, I think, rather transformative for this to, to potentially work. And then there's the unknown of the unknown, which we can get into later, but it's basically when they don't work, when these viruses are administered to people uh, and, and it looks like they'll work in a lab, but they don't in people. Why? Why don't they work? And we can talk about thoughts on that, but we also address that at, at Taylor Labs. Okay. So Simon, I, you wanted to talk yeah. about uh, the clinical skepticism a little bit. I do, yes. Because, um, you know, so the reason I think you brought it up, the initial case reports, um, you know, in which patients have been treated with phage also received concomitant antibiotics. And so it's really difficult to say or pinpoint that, oh, you know, phage is what really helped this patient versus the combination or versus maybe they were going to get better anyway, right? So I think, one, that's something that needs to be addressed in, you know, clinical trials in which the study population is well selected. Um, the other thing I want to point out is that there are certain conditions, and I've now actually started treating patients with phage alone without concomitant antibiotics, um, you know, well-selected patients. And I think it actually does help. And so the skepticism, I think, is there and is valid. And I think it is up to us, uh, in, you know, phage researchers and clinicians to really develop clinical trials that answer a question that, you know, can these phages be used uh, appropriately or not? And there have been a couple of clinical trials that were published. Uh, neither of them worked, um, or phage did not seem to work in those instances. But there were pretty large flaws in them, um, which sort of retrospectively in hindsight is 2020. But I think at the time of the design was difficult. So in one end, in one study, which was uh, the phago burn study, in which patients received pseudomonas phages topically for burn wounds, um, it, it didn't work and placebo was actually better or standard of care was better. But it turned out the patients didn't really actually get phage that killed their organism and they got minimal. So I, I think, you know, that didn't work and it was obvious why it didn't. There was a UTI trial recently in which phages were given intravesicularly within the bladder, but at the same time, the patients also had bladder irrigation. So, um, you know, it's like you're putting it in and you're taking it out and it didn't work. So I think there, there are better ways we need to develop trials um, which address the underlying pathophysiology of the disease we're trying to treat. Yeah. And hopefully and, that and will AAC answer yeah, and AAC published that guidance. Who hopefully so, Vince? What is your? You've been working on this for years. What's your stance on this? What do you think about phage therapy? Yeah, um, I think it'll work, but only in a boutique situation. I think you know. Explain I Explain that. I don't <laughs> think we know enough about how bacteria become resistant to phage. There are many mechanisms. We only know of of, of uh, uh, CRISPR and, and a couple of other, other meth methods by which bacteria become resistant. So the resistance problem has to be overcome. Mm -hmm. And so, and I think a boutique treatment where a, a patient with, with let's say diabetic foot ulcer can't be treated no with normal antibiotics, goes to a center that's sanctioned by the, by the FDA. And that person gets a cocktail of phage designed for the in infection that's being caused uh, by a particular organism. And in that way, I think that will work. But if you're going to make a cocktail, even a mixture of five, six, seven phages, I don't think it's going to work nationwide. It's not like an antibiotic that can work everywhere. You're going to have pockets of organisms in various areas of the country that are going to be resistant. So I think it'll work. And I think it's the, it probably is a smart way to start because you'll flesh out all the problems once you're working in, in, in that type of environment. But you know, that's that's my belief. I think it'll work, but it has to be boutique treatment. Yeah. And I want to uh, go back to that because, I mean, there is an interesting concept evolving about personalized medicine. And I think in infectious diseases, we are sort of catching up to that. That is something well known. In, and this is a prime example, which I think, uh, being a skeptical and all, as I mentioned, that there will be ways um, um, to to do this quickly, potentially, and, and be able to overcome those barriers that you mentioned. So Tony, you have a, a, a system to do that. And because I, the way I, 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 I feel that if you were able to have a sort of 
predetermined phages for certain organisms and then being able to evolve them when they become resistant and be able to change quickly, I think that will be incredibly powerful. So Tony, can you comment on this? Yeah, so what Vince means when he says boutique, I think is that it's, you know, the best application of this technology is when it's highly personalized, as you as you mentioned, say, sir. That is, um, the, the phages are actually directed against the person's bacterial strain. So when we, when we started Taylor, the, the basis for that was the, we would actually develop a personalized cocktail for your infection. Not that we're going to use it for person B's infection, but, but, but yours. And so what clinicians do is they send us the strain from their patient. Usually these patients are uh, infected with an organism that's highly drug resistant, so they don't really have many options to begin with. We will receive the strain. And we immediately screen our library of about 250 different phages now uh, to, to kill that strain. And if they know this, we often know the species, right? So we could actually subgroup our libraries into species-specific phages. And when we hit hits, we then uh, work up those phage. Usually we know a little bit about them, so we know what phage work really well with each other. And we'll make cocktails of these phages in our production platform We'll purify them to very high titers, and then we will test them for sterility, levels of endotoxin if it's against a gram-negative uh, organism, uh, and, and presence of other potentially uh, problematic things that may contaminate a PrEP. And then we submit a report to the FDA working with the clinician and ask them for permission to, to treat the patient. And then we will ship once they give approval to, to the clinician. The clinician will administer the phage cocktail. But the point is, it's, it's not a guess. It is a highly sophisticated way to make a cocktail that targets their strain. If we guessed, if we didn't do it like that, I suspect then that Vince would be uh, mostly proven correct that it, it, it would, you would have more oftentimes failure than success because – the key here is it's a highly personalized cocktail against the patient's strain. Absolutely. I think that's a great yeah. idea. Yeah. And I wanted to add to that. I mean, I think you're right in that, yes, it currently definitely is niche in that we're still learning how to use it. And its potential may be certain patient populations as well. But along with, you know, how critical phage selection is to the patient's isolate, I think patient selection actually is really critical as well. Um, because when sort of we administered it willy nilly, um, you know, we've sort of been, there's some patients that are very interested in getting phage for a particular MDR organism, but that organism really is not the cause of that patient's clinical decompensation, for example. Um, in those instances, uh, I've seen sometimes phage is used. It may or may not get rid of the organism, but the patient doesn't get better. So I think sort of understanding which patients will benefit is also pretty critical, um, both for compassionate use cases, but also as we develop clinical trials. Yeah. The other thing we're trying to understand, okay, I was, can I say one thing? I was going to just add, you sure, know, when sure. we talk about antibiotics, it goes in and it kills the bugs. With phages, we're also mounting an immune response to the viruses. And, you know, there's sort of more than just a two-dimensional picture that we see in vitro that actually happens in vivo. But go ahead. Yeah. No, no, that, that, that's, that's fantastic. I would just uh, discuss something else uh, maybe later. But I, I just want to go to the, to the lysines um, because we now are probably very close to have an approved FDA therapy um, that comes from a phage. Um, which I, I think uh, in, in combination with antibiotics seems pretty powerful, uh, at least for what I know right now and, you know, in the animal data and all that. Uh, so, um, so Vince, can, can you walk us through, through, through that and what do you think is going to be the future of that, those lysines, which are the little atomic bombs that the, that the phage produces? Right. Well, basically, we have one lysine that we created, uh, developed about 10, 20 years ago that was licensed by a biotech company. It's now in phase three clinical trials, late into phase three. Uh, it would have been completed if uh, we didn't have COVID. Uh, that put them behind. But that license um, is it had completed phase two. It is the only alternative to antibiotic to ever get this far in the, F the FDA system. So uh, by the end of this year, we will have the results of that, of that uh, license. 
It is used as an IV treatment, single dose, in combination with antibiotic, a standard of care antibiotic, because these enzymes work synergistically with antibiotics. It turns out that uh, even low doses of lysin will disrupt the, uh, the, the cell wall enough that allows the, uh, the antibiotic to get in more efficiently. So they work well. Uh, the, these, this is a gram positive an enzyme against a gram positive organism. Um, we've developed and other people have, are developing enzymes against gram negative organisms. Those are a little more challenging. Um, they become inactivated easily with serum proteins, um, but they will work topically. But uh, the gram positive enzymes will work systemically and topically. So, so I think in the future is that the gram positive license will get out there first. Uh, the gram negative enzymes will come behind, and um, this is a single was a single dose treatment, and I think they'll get approval for multi dose multi dose treatment, which will work better. I think that the rationale there was this is very new, this is a new class, and they didn't want they were worried about immuno um, uh, immuno reactivity that the patients might anaphylax or whatever they just didn't know enough about it. So a single dose in combination with drug worked quite well, but I think in, in the future, we'll have multiple dr doses of lysin to be, to be, uh, to be used in, in subsequent. Uh, so, uh, so do you envisage a scenario that you could use the phage and the lysin at the same time? Why? Because it's a desperate situation. You yeah, really want to kill this bug. Lysins really work. You kill, you can, you can, in, in vitro, you can kill six logs in vivo. You, you, all you need to do is knock the, the bugs down to one or two logs. And that gives the immune system enough time to, to get in there and kill the organism. That's all we're really doing. But a single dose of lysin in, in, in the clinical trial right now is not sterilizing. It's just dropping the bacterial load down a log or two. And that allows the immune system to get in, the phagocytic system to come in and clear it out. That's really what's happening. Great. Yeah, are, are these Sorry. lysins? I was just going to ask the question, actually. So is this lysin that you're using for your clinical trial a single lysin? Uh, does it have like biofilm penetration? How long does it last, et cetera? It's got, it's about one hour, hour and a half, half, half life in, in humans. In mice, it's about 30 minutes. But in humans, they found that it was about an hour and a half uh, to two hours. Um, they, um, they work quite efficiently. They, um, what was the other part of the question? So does it penetrate biofilm? Because I think the yeah. clinical trial is looking at staph or is bacteremia. And endocarditis. Uh, right. But and what the, about... Endocarditis works quite well. It destroys okay. the biofilm. Basically what it's doing is it's destroying the organism at the top of the biofilm. Those organisms are exploding and, and, and going away and it just keeps grinding down the biofilm. So it, it definitely destroys the biofilms in vitro and in vivo data that have shown that. Okay, because actually, I mean, so it does, so it does digest polysaccharides. It, it kills the peptide, okay. it cleaves the peptidoglycan. Got it, okay. It, they're peptidoglycan hydrolases. Correct, that, that are seated in the biofilm. And they, the, the animal models are pretty impressive uh, when you do this. But let's, let's, let's go back to, to the phages. Um, so, uh, Anthony, so what sort of infections have you, um, being requested uh, type of infections. And then I'll ask Saima, what, what is the current uh, state of the art of what kind of infections we, we, we think we can use phages for that? Uh, let me just first also uh, add to the conversation about the lice and that it, um, I, I think in a post antibiotic use future, there will be multiple uh, new ways in which we're addressing the problem. And it, it will not be one singular class of, of, of entities. And so I think that's an important thing is yeah. it's not necessarily a license versus antibiotic or a license versus phage conversation. It's a, it's a more holistic, uh, cumulative uh, sort of uh, addressing the issue with, with things that may work well in one case, but, but not in others. I just wanted to put that out there, but it just gives us more tools in our toolbox. More tools all. instead, sure. instead of just, you know, static, unchangeable chemical structures, which, you know, have, have uh, moieties that, that the chemist alter, but that the bacteria then defeat and, and then get this de-incentivized and get out of the business. Right. So, but to, to address your, your question, Cesar, about what types of infections, uh, 
This, this is a really good question because it, what it highlights is the extent of the problem. And the answer to the question is everything. We get requests for every type of bacterial infection uh, that you could really imagine for, for phage. And that just means that the clinicians that are treating these infections are, are desperate. They're at their wits end for, for alternatives or options for their patients. They have exhausted standard of care clinical options and they need something. Otherwise there's, there's going to be no recourse for, for their patients. And so everything from uh, um, biofilm forming uh, on catheters to, to indwelling devices, to those who have prosthetics, to uh, bacteremia, so bacterial infections of the blood that have spread systemically, to chronic UTIs for which uh, there seems to be no relief despite multiple courses of distinct antibiotic treatments, to topical uh, infections such as an abscess or a, or a diabetic foot. We really have received all types of requests. I think we're at something like 30 different bacterial types of infections and we've addressed about a third of them with our with our phage libraries, uh, about a third. But there's a lot more work to 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 be made up here because of the extent to which this is a real problem. So, Saima, you as a clinician, uh, guide us. Uh, what would you think right now will be the best infections to try this? Um, and I'll, I'll I'll give you later two examples which I find myself desperate sometimes. I think sort of as Anthony mentioned that everything has, you know, he's received requests and we've received requests for all kinds of infections. It's difficult to answer your question of what is the best infection to treat with phage. Um, I'm a transplant physician and transplant or immunocompromised patients in general, because of their medical issues and recurrent hospitalizations tend to have high rates of drug resistant infections. So I, I think sort of niches that people are looking into and that I've seen success in are sort of, you know, cystic fibrosis patients that have chronic MDR pseudomonas infections and not so much trying to resolve the infection, but to bring it down enough so that the patient's breathing capability is improved. Um, I've treated several now kidney transplant patients that have recurrent UTIs sometimes from very susceptible organisms, but that keep on getting, you know, Cipro every five days, not five days, but five day courses, you know, every several weeks for years, uh, eventually on ertapenem because it's an ESBL over time. So some of these patients have actually done well. So the issue is not so much for the kidney transplant recurrent UTI getting rid of the actual infection because we can use ertapenem and resolve it, but really prevent it from coming back each time. So really trying to get to that colonization aspect of it. And in these cases, I've used phage alone and have seen success uh, in which the kidney patients, you know, that are not coming back with re recurrent UTIs and their kidney is working better over time. There's a lot of, I think, uh, clinicians are facing with staph aureus and pseudomonas LVAD infections and other cardiac devices. So pacemaker infections is somewhat easy in that when you have an infection, you can take the pacemaker out, you know, clear it, put a new one in. With LVAD, which is the left ventricular cyst device, the device actually sort of goes into the heart and the aorta. So taking it out is not an easy thing. When they get infected, patients are on antibiotics for years. Um, we've had many requests and, uh, you know, others have too, in which we've tried to use phage. Uh, I personally have not had a lot of success in the setting of pseudomonas VAD infections. Uh, I have had with staph aureus. So again, I think, you know, the others are then recurrent bacteremia is also in which it's, the issue really is the colonization aspect rather than the urtapenem or something you can use for uh, getting rid of the bacteremia. So there are all kinds of infections people have looked at it and that ARLG document you referenced sort of tries to go through that of who we think currently would be good patients to select for phage therapy. So um, yeah, the two group of patients that I was gonna talk about is was the LVA patients and of course the orthopedic infections with, uh, uh, you know, prosthetic joint infections, which are a complete nightmare because people are completely incapacitated with this. And, and uh, so would that make any difference? Um, and I'm, I'm going to go to, to uh, Anthony here um, to make the fish 
locally, so let's say you have a prosthetic joint infection, would make it the difference to do it there at the site of infection that you have an ability to instill the phages there versus systemically? I think so. Uh, it's interesting that we're on this topic now because one of the more bizarre cases that we actually made a phage for, um, there was a, a woman who uh, she had a, she developed a enterobacter infection of a prosthetic device and it was walled off in inside or, or in a little uh, granuloma on inside the joint, the, the artificial device. And um, she, they had tried every antibiotic for her uh, and, and she had suffered for almost two years with this infection. She had to sometimes get drained and, and a lot of clinical care and so she kept asking her, her physician to, she had heard about phage therapy on the news, you know, can we try it? Can we try it? And uh, he, he, he would, he kept requesting, you know, that, that, that they, they not. And so she threatened to starve herself in order to have somebody potentially make phages and, and try phage therapy. And so the case came to us in, in this format and so we got the strain and uh, we, we found some really good phages against that, that bacteria strain. And uh, the, the immediate suggestion was inject it in there. Let it, let it because it's, it's walled off already. Let them go to town, go battle. You know, phage will amplify, right? That's a key that once you get one single infection, you, you can produce 50 to 100 particles. And so uh, it turned out that it worked really well, and she was uh, cleared of the infection. And she actually went to the to the ID rounds, got up on the stage, and and, and told her story, and and told about the starvation and stuff. So it was it was, it was a good thing. But I think that the, to to the point, um, having them in close quarters like that, where where having to pharmacokinetically get it to that site. Uh, probably was the difference here. And I suspect that it may not have penetrated if it was like intravenous or, or, or given some other way. So Vince, how about the license, the, the difference between being able to instill the license, which I think will be, I'm really excited about this because for this LVAD infection, for example, and that you could potentially do it, or the orthopedic infection that you could instill that in, in the site of infection versus systemically. So what do you think about that? You think that will work? Yeah, we've done it. We've done it. We've published a paper on where we've done it in an S, uh, a prosthetic device and in, in, a, in a mouse model, of course. Uh, we've done it interthecally. We've done it injected directly into in, in the spinal cord. Uh, so it, basically, in, originally, we thought that license could only be used topically. But over the years, we found out that basically, if the, you can treat it with an antibiotic, you can treat it with a license. The license can will at least the gram positive license, the gram negative license have, as I mentioned, have their issues systemically, but but the gram positive license will work in probably every format, every uh, site in the body to kill the organism. Okay, um, and, and Saima, uh, let, everyone likes to find out what are the side effects of this? You know, people are gonna ask. So what, what are the side effects? And, uh, and, you know, every time you introduce something new, people are always worried about side effects. And we live in a culture of skepticism for everything. So, uh, so what can we tell people about that? So most patients, so one, you know, you talked about mode of administration. Um, so patients have received phages uh, by nebulization or inhale, so directly into the lungs. You heard Anthony talk about injecting it. Um, they've also, people have also sort of pushed it into, you know, through drains into abdominal cavities, uh, as well as intravenously. Uh, most of my experience has been intravenous. Uh, again, most patients tolerate it well. Uh, we started off the podcast, I think it was mentioned that not infect human cells. Uh, so there's quite a lot of data behind that, or at least most of the time they don't. Um, so we don't see issues like nephrotoxicity or bone marrow suppression. Um, but again, we haven't used this in too many patients. You know, it hasn't been used in thousands and thousands. It's more like in hundreds. It appears quite safe. One caveat uh, that I do have um, is at times when patients are infected with a variety of different organisms. Uh, so for a CF patient, for example, with many different pseudomonas isolates um, or an LVAD patient with 
you know, variety of Pseudomonas isolates within that biofilm because of antibiotic pressure over time. At times, the phage may be so targeted and specific that it only knocks out like one, you know, a, a, a part of that isolate or a part of not the isolate, but the population of isolates. And so if we're targeting and getting rid of just, you know, 10% of what's on the LVAD, uh, we don't want the other organism to sort of overgrow and make the patient sicker. I've seen several of these patients actually develop bacteremias after getting phage therapy, I think, because it was so specific and targeted. Um, and so that this is, but this is the setting of a vascular infection. Um, and so, you know, patients have done well and we changed antibiotics and that improved. But that's just something to watch out for, not specifically an adverse event, I think, of the phage per se, but of how we're using it in the patient we selected. So, uh, Vincent, how about the license? You know, people are always concerned you instill a protein, you can develop antibodies against it uh, uh, or be, you know, an allergic reaction, an anaphylactic reaction. Um, so can you comment on this? Sure. Um, the phase two studies show that, number one, that it, it was safe. Uh, FDA was concerned about immunogenicity because of an anaphylaxis reaction. Uh, it, it, they, they um, In phase two, there was... The IgE levels were extremely low in the in those patients. Uh, there was no anaphylaxis. There was no uh, no uh, antibody effect at all that was seen in, in any of these patients. So in general, it's quite safe. The uh, at, there were no adverse events, no more than the than the control patients. So it 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 was a safe safe drug based on on those at least phase two studies. Okay, great. So Anthony. Um, the combination of phages. So how do you choose those phages? How, how do you combine it? How many you put? Um, what is the ideal number? And, and so on and so forth. How do you decide that? Uh, so it's, um, we, the first stage is we, we, will, we have quantitative measures for lysis. So the very simple thing to do is to just simply look at how efficient of a lytic killer they are and that could be, if you have three or four phages that are very good at lytic killing, it, it would seemingly make sense that you, you'd include them in. But I, I think the perhaps more intelligent thing to do is to construct cocktails to take advantage of the natural history of the phage. So there are 10 to the 31th phage, different type of phage on planet Earth that's more than a noble stars in the universe. And they've had 3 billion years to evolve different ways to kill bacteria. 70% of all phage genomes are unannotated, meaning they have extremely diverse genetic variability, right? So you could harness the, the different properties of the phage to make cocktails that target the natural history of the bacterial infection. So I'll give you a, a good example. E. coli is an organism that uh, is, is really resistant to a lot of antibiotics, but it mutates pretty readily. And therefore, it can become resistant to just about anything that you can kind of throw at it. But it can't become infinitely resistant. It is evolutionarily locked into certain pathways. And so one way in which we select our phages is uh, we, we grew the, the bacteria up in the presence of phages. And when a outgrowth or resistant batch of E. coli emerged, we developed another phage to target that lineage. When that outgrew into another lineage, then we'd come in with another phage to, to, to cut off that route. And so now we have a cocktail of four anti-E. coli phages that when you put them all in the, in, the, in the mixture, E. coli cannot become resistant to them. And that's harnessing the genetic power of the phage because the nucleic acid has much more variability in producing new chemical spaces then there's any chemistry you could ever perform. And so we do that. We select our phages for, for different properties. We have a destructor phage cocktail that has three different biofilm destroying activities. And we, we put those together. We have a, a lyser phage cocktail that is made of the most efficient, uh, high burst size producing phage. And, and so this will often go into our, our patients. And we think that that these are ways in which we are going to make these things highly efficacious in the future by very intelligent design of the cocktails that adapt to the to the actual niche of the bacterial infection. I don't think I answered yep. your question completely. I just one one little point is that antibodies to the license 
don't neutralize the lysine's activity. So even though okay. you, you may make an antibody to a protein, this protein, it doesn't neutralize its effect. Okay, and, great. and also, as an aside, we don't see resistance to lysine. No one has ever, in the 20 years we've been working with lysine, there are no resistant organisms to lysine. You can force the, the resistance by mutagenizing the organism. You still can't find resistance. Great. Now, okay, I'm going to so, add, sorry, uh, one, so the other sure. way phages are being used for treatment actually is to add in a genetic payload. So you're actually modifying the phage itself. So taking use of its receptors to attach to E. coli or whatever, but actually having a different payload in it that injects within the cell. So whether it's going to get rid of antibacterial resistance or other factors can be used as well. Sure. Fascinating conversation, guys. I'm, I'm just going to ask you now to, to just very briefly tell me how do you see this evolving in the next five, 10 years? Uh, let's just start with Saima. What, what do you think? I think we have a lot of work to do. Um, there's, I mean, if I think five to 10 years is a very short time period. Um, that's just about enough for people to do some clinical trials and learn from trial and error of how to kind of make it better. I, I think in the long term, sort of a couple of decades, I, I think it truly will be a more easily available, useful tool in our armamentarium against MDR. Vincent, final remarks? Well, I think, um, I think once phase three is completed and successful, um, I think there are companies that are poised to jump in and start developing various enzymes uh, uh, against the particular organism they're interested in. So I think it's been, it's, people have been waiting for this phase, phase three to be completed before they jump in and spend a lot of money in, in developing license, but I think that will happen. Okay. The final words, Anthony, for you. Yeah, I think we're going to recognize, uh, start recognizing that bacterial infections are chronic diseases. And the, to, to think of them as acute, in some cases is true, but that as you had, have an aging population of nearly 8.2 billion people now uh, that are being kept alive by extreme medical advances, you're going to have bacterial microbes colonizing certain niches and, and screwing things up, and they're going to continue to mutate. And so I think that there will be centers that will grow around the world that will model sort of the personalized infectious disease approach and you will have these centers perfect the art of production, making them safe, and people will receive personalized cocktails that address their specific infection. That won't be the entire arm and radium in, 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 in solving the problem, but for the most difficult and challenging of infections, it will be the catch net for some people. And that'll become more and more accepted, and the regulatory agencies will adjust their mindset to it because the demand will be great. Beautiful, beautiful conversation, fascinating conversation. We could go on, but unfortunately, we have to leave it there. I really thank you guys for uh, your your insights in the podcast, and and thank you for the audience of, of, to to listen and 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 and, and watch this. Uh, this is uh, Cesar Arias, editor in chief of AAC, signing off. <laughs>